Hello and welcome to the two-man power trip of wrestling. I am your host, JP John Paz. With me today is a very special guest, a former Ring of Honor World Tag Team Champion. He is, of course, a member of the vaunted Carnage Crew. He is Mr. H.C. Loke, the Extreme Referee. Loke, how are you doing today, sir? Good, brother. How are you? Thanks for having me today. Yeah, no problem. I am doing good. What's uh, What's been going on in your world? What have you been up to? A lot of wrestling, man. It's 26 years now. I was just trying to figure it out the other day. I've had over 100 this year so far. So, And uh, running the school, keeping busy, you know, lots of wrestling in my life. I'm a lucky old man. What's the school? Fighting Arts Pro Wrestling Institute is what, is what we're called. And it's uh, <clears throat> I actually had a building put up for it. So uh, so it's a cool thing. It's a, it's a permanent home for a gym and dojo and all those things. We have a couple TV set up so we can do tape studies and my rings in there and we run about four nights a week in there, depending on how much I'm on the road. And uh, Real lucky. Got some good, good kids coming up. Where's it at? Where's it located? Camp Bell, New York. That's my hometown. Uh, so small that, little town, upstate? but if you, yeah, upstate. So if you, if you look at uh, Binghamton and Rochester on the map and you would take I-86 to get, from one to the other, I'm directly in the middle, directly in the middle there. So <laughs> pretty cool. We have people, um, I've been lucky, you know, lucky to have a pretty decent resume, resume, which we'll probably get into here. So, mm -hmm. so it gives me a little bit of attention. So I have people driving in from all over. They'll come in for the weekend or whatever. So to try to come in and we coach them up a little bit and send them on their way and it's going well. When did you start the school? This version of this school, I would say, Gosh, we're probably only three months in to like officially having a name and having a building. I've uh, I've been training guys for too long, way too long. I mean, like since uh, since uh, I, I went to wrestling school, started in 1994, and um, by 1996 they were having me help teach the class, which is not what you should do. But I didn't know anything at the time. But um, so I've been training guys on and off that whole time, and um, maybe over the last of the course four or five years. There's been some small indies around by me that have asked me to help run a school or be in charge of their schools. And for various reasons, we've got, I've got a hold of some good guys out of that, but whatever money on their end or building trouble, well, COVID hit, that was the big thing. We lost a building with one of them. So I said, you know what? Heck with it. We, uh, uh, my future wife and I, we bought a ring and bought a building and said, there, now this thing will never go anywhere. We got a place for our kids to be all the time. So it's pretty cool. Now, you've been around the business for a long time. You said 94 start, 96, you started training guys. It's pretty uh, – Yeah, pretty yeah. like I said, that's, that. that's that's not advisable. I didn't know enough to teach people, but I – you know, the guy, it was uh, – but, you know, I was doing good, so uh, so they so they let me help out. But, yeah, my first match ever was uh, January 15, 1995. So coming up on 27 years, 26 and something now. So, yeah, I've been around a long time. Wow, damn, that's pretty damn impressive. When you do like the teaching in the school and stuff, what's like the the style or you know? Because sometimes you hear like WWE power plant. Oh, they're working into the ground. You don't get in the ring for a while. Then when you get in the ring, you know they really work you hard. Like, what's your style? Are you hard on the guys? Are you kind of I, well? Coach? I would say as far well hard on. I, I'm I'm uh, I'm picky. I would say that you know we want to do things the right way. There's uh, it's real easy to develop and then keep bad habits in our business, you know, little things you can do, um, or not, or should not do. Um, you mentioned the power plant and that, you know, drive you into the ground, you know, work you to death type of thing. That's exactly what I don't do. And, um, not because that's not good. I, uh, we, I, uh, I spend a lot of time telling the guys about what they should be doing diet and exercise wise and train and, and in the gym. But at the same time, that's your, that that's what you do on your own time to me. You know, it's, um, it's uh, there's some, uh, there's some just basic truths. If you don't want to put in the effort to be in a decent, in decent shape and have a decent look, then then that then you're limiting yourself. So when you're with me, when we're here at the school, I talk about that. I've written diets out for guys. I've, I've written uh, workouts out for guys. But when we're actually physically training. It's um, it's all about wrestling. It's all you know. Uh, uh, everything we do, uh, I don't want to say everything we do goes inside the ring because we have a lot of guys, and sometimes guys are rolling around outside on the mats and stuff. But um, but it's all it's all based on actual pro wrestling and wrestling techniques, as opposed to we don't do the whole thing. All right, go 
run up that hill and back down 20 times and get in the ring and do a thousand squats and then I'll teach you how to lock up. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that that's a bad way to do it, but I, I'm more about, you know, you, you need to be in shape, but let me teach you how to wrestle, you know, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. I hear some crazy stories about schools where it's like, oh, we didn't get in the in the ring for 30 days or we were running circles and, you know, all this like crazy stuff. It's like, wow, what the heck? Yeah. I mean, I, I see some value in that. You have to you have to work hard. You have to pay your dues. You have to show you really want it. But there's also a certain element and um, not talking about any specific schools or trainers, but there's also a certain element of and there always has been and probably always will be in the business of, well, you know, if I can get this guy to quit. You know, I don't, you know, I don't have to give them any money back and, you know, stuff like that. And that's, that's not how I do things. I mean, I I would say I might have years ago um, before I mellowed out a little bit, you know, um, uh, I'm still just a strict on you need to respect our business, respect our etiquette, respect the veterans, follow some of these unwritten rules that we have and and those things will never change. But um, as far as that whole like hollering at guys or, or being super military like, um, I kind of take a different approach. I guess maybe that's part of getting older. I don't know. It's a, it's a very, it's a very positive vibe. I believe in, you know, we're all getting better together in there, you know, uh, but, uh, you know, positive until someone for any reason were to, you know, be disrespectful or something like that, then that can switch. If it has to, you know, you have to kind of, there's, there's, um, you have to kind of protect our business a little bit, you know what I mean? And there, there's certain way you should act and talk and all those things. But, but, um, yeah, none none of those, you know, uh, run 50 laps and then, you know, do some squats and then I'll teach you how to take a back bump or something like that. No, we go, we go right to, we go right to wrestling. It's funny, both, uh, well, not both, but two of the members of Carnage Crew, you and DeVito, both became trainers. You know what I mean? That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, um, we, uh, we're, we're, we're kind of, yeah, I always say Tony is kind of as corny as he sounds. He's my wrestling soulmate. I talked to him today. You know, we we're always kind of right on the same page that with and not so much that we always think exactly alike, but we complement each other well. So uh, as uh, and, and yes, we both uh, had some good luck training guys, you know, or, or at least had our our um, uh, uh, at least helped, co- if not train from scratch, coaching, you know, um, uh, for instance, uh, he, he's had some some names that you would definitely know. Um, like Bobby Fish is his student. And uh, yeah. And um, Dodge Chief and ROH now, Bill Carr is his student. And I had Dunn and Marcos were mine. They were Ring of Honor standouts. And yep. I always get credit for uh, Colin Delaney and Brody Lee, which is a huge, huge uh, honor. But actually, my students physically trained them. I was I was more uncle than dad in that respect. So that tells you how old I am. But I was around, you know, I think I was there. I think I showed Brody his first bump, God bless him. But, um, you know, uh, but yeah, so. So yeah, we've been lucky. We've got a we've got a pretty good track record as trainers. Yeah, Devito had Cheech and Massive yeah, Cheech. at one point. That guy yep. Massive. Yep. Yeah, that's right. I haven't seen Massive in a long time. Yep. With Brody Lee, how well did you know him, and, and like what was the training of him like? Because obviously, you know, gone way, way, way. Oh God, him. yeah. I I knew him very well, and I say knew because uh, when he went on to WWE, and this is, you know, not to get on a downer uh so early in our talk here but this is one of the biggest regrets i have in my career is that um thinking my heart was in the right place when he went on to wwe i checked out i checked in on him a few times told him i was proud of him i still have the messages where he told me i really fucking appreciate that man and all that stuff you know but um and then you've been around the business a long time you know how it gets when um guys get a little bit of success Everybody blows up their phone. Hey, brother, 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 and all that stuff, you know. And I just want to let John be John. Bro, you know, Brody be Brody and live his life and have his family and do those things. And I didn't bug him and I didn't reach out as much as I should, you know. And then now it's too late, right? But uh, you asked about training him. I wish I could take full credit for that. I can't. I, I was, um, like I said, he was doing backyard stuff at first. And I don't mean that in a bad way. That's just how he and Colin and a lot of guys started. And then they went around and they did it right. Um, and I can remember when I was teaching a school called the NMW, New Millennium Wrestling, I think it was, up in Rochester. I can uh, remember this big but shy, quiet kid sitting over there and finally, come on, buddy, get in the ring. We showed him how to bump, like maybe for real, I think the first time. And, and I was always around then from the time he was having his 
I don't know what you call his first quote unquote real matches, you know. Um, and uh, but he he came up in the city of Rochester. When I've been there most of my career, I, I live like an hour and a half from Rochester, but I've kind of been in that scene most of my career. So I was always the hey, will you watch my match? Is there anything you'd do different? Can we can we talk before or after the show type of thing, you know? And I like that role a lot, you know. I especially now I, that's so um. So to that degree, I was I was uh, involved in teaching him, but I wouldn't I wouldn't call my I, it'd be an honor if I could, but I can't honestly say that I took him from scratch and that I was his sole trainer. Gunn and Marcos, I believe, were so I kind of in that you know one step away because I was their trainer, but um, but yeah, so but but it was you know it's a uh, it you know before he passed, it was an honor to say that I had anything to do with him, and so. You know, he's, he's so sorely missed, for sure. We were at uh, – I went up to visit at Dynamite this last week when they were in Rochester, and, of course, they dedicated that show to him. And and what a night, what an experience that was. Very cool. We miss him all. We all miss him. Yeah, it's just unbelievable the way that all happened. He's obviously very, very young. He's only 41 years old. I mean, Yeah, it's crazy. Crazy. Way too young. Just crazy. Yeah. yeah. For sure. With you – like going backwards almost a little bit, but with you, who was your trainer when you were breaking in? Like who, tra- who taught you? When I first started, um, I, well, my first intent, the first, I didn't, I didn't have any idea how to break in and I didn't think that I would really be, anybody would let me because I, I'm five foot eight, maybe, you know? And when I started, Ray Mysterio wasn't even on american television yet and if he and if he debuted in ecw i didn't get it yet so i hadn't seen so you know not not that i i think i'm taller than him but you know i I was considered there's no way somebody my size was going to do it but i found i think pwi or one of those had al snow's school um uh an ad for it and i called out there and i got information sent i was trying to get up the nerve to go but I was so shy and I never left home and I was pretty sure they wouldn't let me do it anyway. Cause I was small. I had that in my head. That's what everybody told me. I mean, everybody, like my best friends and my family and not in a negative way, but everybody was sure that they won't even let you try. You're not tall enough. Um, so I kind of got spooked on that. And then I, this is why I say it was totally fake. Like uh, this is what I was meant to do. Um, because somehow, some way right then, the local tiny, tiny TV station news popped up that there was a, a, a wrestling gym opening up like 15 minutes from my house, 20 minutes from my house type of thing. Um, so I went down there and I was their first student. And I can, I told this story a lot of times, but it's so true. And it always takes me right back to it. I, I waited outside in my truck for 45 minutes or an hour because I was getting up the nerve to go in because I was sure they were going to tell me I was too short. And so my game plan was, I'm going to go in here. I'm going to ask if I can train. They're going to tell me no. And then I'm going to ask them if I can just be the guy that sweeps up at the gym just to learn right. about it and just to be around it, you know, and uh, is there anything I can do? That that was my plan. Ask if I could be the janitor at a pro wrestling school uh, because I loved it and I wanted to know more about it and I wanted to be involved. But I didn't think they would let me do it. Luckily, that wasn't a factor. They just wanted – you know, relatively cheap for those days. They wanted my 1500 bucks and um, they let me train. And uh, uh, Bob Bailey was the name of the man that owned the school. It was under the United States Wrestling Federation, which is where I had my first several matches. And there was a trainer named T.C. Reynolds, who was a journeyman out of Butler, Pennsylvania. And uh, he, um, he was the guy that played doink down there and he wrestled as Batman sometimes. And just, you know, a journeyman indie guy, that that kind of guy. And um, and uh, Tom Bosnowski is his name. Um, and I still I, I thank him every year on Facebook. But uh, he, uh, you know, he might not have been a big star. And maybe, and, and, and forgive me, Tom, if you ever see this, he might not have been the world's greatest athlete, but what a mind he had. Like, I, like uh, he wasn't going to teach us how to do backflips by any means, you know, and you don't need to know that, kids, by the way. But uh, he um, but he could teach us how to tell a story, you know, so relatively soon, I feel like I started picking up, you know, kind of a little bit how to do this, a little bit how to tell a little bit of a story, you know, like, it, you know, I say soon, it was a matter of months, you know, but um, 
But uh, so that's who trained me. And then that's actually the school where kind of in the old used car business, Carney way of the business, the owner figured out, man, I could pay TC to come up every other week instead of every week. And then Loke, Matt is my name, is uh, is my, our top trainer. And I can just have him show these guys stuff for free whenever TC is not here. So that's how I ended up kind of teaching to gotcha. maybe earlier than I should. But um, and then uh, moving on, they, they, they would let me um, they let me in battle royals and you set up the ring and, and they started me off slow, um, which is cool. You know, I always try to get my guys to like ease in that I, I really eased in though though for almost a year and a half i just did battle royals and eight man tags and six man tags finally did some straight up tag team matches just kind of eased my way in and then my first singles match wasn't until 1996 actually and that was against steve carino so that was a pretty cool first singles wow looking yeah. back i mean that's pretty awesome carino yeah, for people. sure yeah yeah and he, he was my biggest storyline, really, in, in ECW. So it's funny how things work out. Yeah. What did you think of him back then? Did you see anything in him? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, uh, and I recently, somebody found, I don't know how it could have ever happened. Somebody found that tape and put it on YouTube. And um, I look back at it now, and I've always remembered it. Man, that was a pretty good first match. Um, but, you know, not knowing what I didn't know yet, I looked at it recently. and like, boy, Steve was already so good. You know, because he'd been around a year or so longer than me, and he worked his ass off to get me through it, you know. Um, but um, I remember thinking that he was real easy to work with, and he was very helpful. And um, and uh, he treated me like a peer, which we kind of were. He'd been around a little bit longer than me, but he definitely was helping me. Um, so, yeah, I don't know that at the time I would have guessed the success that he had, you know. Well, but, I mean, I wouldn't have guessed the success I had either. I mean, it, it, I was, you know, at the time considered short and I'm average height. Now I see guys every weekend that are shorter than me even, you know, or, oh, but, yeah. um, you know, I'm, you know, like I said, five, eight. And uh, at the time, you know, didn't get the diet and exercise figured out yet. So kind of a puffy looking dude. And he was skinny and gangly and we're two goofy looking kids, you know, and then fast forward and you know, all these years later, and he's ECW world champion and zero one champion and NWA world champion and coach at the performance center. And I'm ring of honor tag team champion. And the first guy ever hired to be a locker room agent at ring of honor and teaching a school now. And we were the two goofiest looking kids that you would never think would have a career. And I'm not comparing my, his, he's had his resume is better than mine, but, and I'm awful proud of him, but, but it's funny to look at that now and probably think that those were the last two guys you would have picked that would have had, decent career so and he's done excellent and i am quite proud of what i pulled off too so when did you start doing like enhancement matches for wbf and wcw and stuff um that would have been uh 97 98 uh, i mean most people talk about my match with luna you know i don't know if you know about that one yeah but yep. that was that was that was like the first ever like not intergender but it might that's be the, the first call. ever yeah, yeah. right yeah, that's Actually. what they called it on Raw, the first intergender match in WWF history. So, I mean, I don't know. You know how they are. I don't know if they say that now. They changed their right. history. But um, but that was kind of cool, you know, at the time. And that, because that's such a – it's fairly big now, you know, and who real, I didn't realize that I was a part of any type of history at the time. I was just – that's where my lack of size for that time came in handy because – in all honesty, lot, Raw was already being taped. It was that was a taped Raw, but it was it was already you know matches in the ring. It was going on when they came up with this idea. And I was, and I had been told I wasn't working that day. And you know, and then Tony Gurria came up to me, kind of laughing, uh, basically. Yeah, you're going to work with Luna. Said, all right, yes, sir. And um, and it went really well. And you know, of course, Dustin roughed me up a little bit beforehand, and she was sweet to me, and they were cool. And, yeah, that's pretty neat, you know, and, um, but, you know, again, it was a different time. I, uh, I remember, um, after that for, for some old timers and now they call me an old timer, but, but the guys that were old timers, then only a couple of them, but one in particular, I still live with my parents, but called me at my parents' house to, yeah, you should have told them you were sick. You should have told them, no, they'll never use you. Blah, blah, blah. You buried yourself. Blah, blah. Well, 
turns out I didn't bury myself too bad. I did okay, you know, but um, right. at the time, you know, I, well, this veteran's telling me, you know, I shouldn't have done that, but I, you know, you do what you're asked to do. You do, you, and every time, every time you're given an opportunity to step into a ring, whether it's to win or lose, to a man or a woman, to somebody bigger or smaller, if you got two minutes or 20 minutes, it's an opportunity. And it's a chance to get better. It's a chance to get seen. It's a chance to pick up a new trick. And I was glad I did it then. I'm glad I did it now. Why did they say you buried yourself like they didn't want you to do that? What was the reasoning? I, you know what? You kind of broke up a little bit, bit there, buddy. Can you ask me that again? Yeah. What was the reasoning that they said you shouldn't have jobbed, like you shouldn't have done it? Because she's a woman. How dumb is that? I mean, that sounds ridiculous in 2021. But in 1998, the mindset right. was a little different, and um, and that, that was 100 percent why. You know, I can remember, I'll tell you exactly who it was, and I, and I like him a lot, but you might not remember him. But AJ Petruzzi, well, he was a big enhancement guy in the 80s, and um, he was there all the time on the road with him and stuff like that. And called me at my parents' house to tell me, you should have pretended you were sick. You should have gone blah, blah, like yelling at me, you know, and um, and uh. And uh, I'm like, oh, man, did I screw up? And he's and well, next time they call you for at least a year, you tell them, no, you don't go back to any more tapings. Blah, 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 blah. And, and I did shy away for a little while. And then it didn't end up really being that big of an issue because shortly thereafter, I went to uh, um, uh, ECW. So, you know, it, 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 it didn't really it didn't end up mattering anyway. And I didn't, you know, in hindsight, it wouldn't have mattered. I did what I was asked to do and i believe i did it well and i was told i did it well and um and that's what you do you know but at the time that was a big oh you got beat by a girl i got beat by a girl who's tougher than most men and not to mention i got beat up by dustin runnels beforehand who's a foot taller than me so i don't think that it looked too fake you know it was uh you know I, i'm fine with it yeah the way it was executed on tv didn't really make you look you know, like, oh, you lost a woman. If she's a complete psycho, like character-wise, and right. Dustin is a monster. So, yeah. right, yeah. So, no regrets on that whatsoever. Did that get you signed with ECW? Did Paul take notice? Oh no, I boy, I'm not even sure that he would have ever known. I mean, maybe he did, you know. But um, what basically happened there was uh, initially I just uh, showed up, and uh, and how funny how things work out. Um, uh, I showed up to see if I could help with the ring. And uh, uh, Tony DeVito, my future partner, my wrestling soulmate, was on ring crew at the time. And Angel Medina, the Spanish angel, who would go on to be his partner in ECW, they were on ring crew as among, as among other people. I knew Angel from the Indies, too. And, yeah, man, come on in here and help if you want to. And then um, when uh, when you'd help with the ring, they'd let you get in the ring and work out, you know, before the doors open. And, we would do that in every town and uh, Tracy Smothers ran the workouts and stuff like that. And um, that day that was in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, the first time I showed up to do it. And I was the only local guy. And this, that very rarely happened that there was only one, but I was the only guy that showed up to, that wasn't, that didn't work there to help and try to get in the ring. So, um, and the got the boys would love that to make a game out of that. It was kind of everybody against me. Like it was everybody could tag but me, you know, and they blow you up and blah, 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 blah. And I didn't quit. You know, I don't know how great I did, but, you know, yeah, I come back sometime if you want to. You know, that's cool. Thanks for the help. All right. So I came back for two or three more weeks. And coincidentally, right around that time, I um, had been speaking to uh, Dory Funk and uh, he was uh, he'd done the um, the dojos for WWE, WWF at the time where they were, you know, bringing Edge and Christian out of there and doing those little one-week camps or whatever. And uh, he started doing one-week camps on his own down in Ocala, Florida. And uh, I did his first one, and it was me and a, um, a guy, the Musketeer, who ended up doing a little bit in uh, ECW, actually. But um, it was it was me and a bunch of indie guys who went on to do well, a really good friend of mine named that I went to wrestling school with named Dave to John. He wrestled as danger. He's a big dude. I can't believe that he didn't get somewhere. And Amy Dumas, uh, Lita was there. That's where I met her. And we spent the week together and myself and Amy and my friend Dave got really tight. And we, 
we, you know, went to dinner every day and, you know, hung out in each other's rooms and stuff like that. And that camp went really, really well for me. Um, like, uh, I, I, I had, had everything clicking down there. And, um, at the end of the week, um, there's basically only three of us that, uh, you train for a week and then on the last day there's a live show. Um, so there was the live show and, uh, I, I, I had a singles match and then I was, uh, I, uh, seconded Amy for her match. I was like manager dude in the corner, just doing, taking some bumps or whatever. Then after that, it, myself, Amy and my friend Dave danger, we all asked coach Do Dory if we could, you know, have a minute with them. So we each went in one at a time and I don't know why everybody else didn't do this, but we did. And, um, and they each got some feedback, and I did, and I can remember it um, word for word. He said, uh, um, "He said, I think you're a great carpenter, which means you can build a match. And his right. exact words were, and, you know, he might have been overshot a little bit, but his words were, he says, I think you can draw money for any company of the, in the world, and I'd like to help. What do you think about ECW? That's what he said. I said, Coach, that's my dream. Thank you so much whatever I said, you know, um, you know, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. He called Tommy dreamer the next day, the next, uh, Saturday, uh, we were at the Elks lodge in Queens and our ECW was, and instead of me just kind of helping with the ring and seeing if somebody notices me, it was help with the ring. And Tommy knew I was coming and said, you need to have a match, uh, a singles match, pick an opponent before, uh, doors open. And I did that and it went well. And, and basically, Dreamer said, you know, I can't hire you on the spot, but if you would like to come to the shows, if we ever need a guy, if somebody's not there, I can get you worked in and you can continue to to show your face. Um, so I did that for two months straight, made every single show, not getting paid, mind you, and not because of anything you might have heard about ECW in the way, right. you know, but because I wasn't on the payroll yet. Um, and... Uh, you know, and, and I'll tell you the this is probably this is the coolest story of my career and one of the coolest stories of my life. Once again, it's funny how things kind of line up for me. My first match was with Steve Carino, then my big feud was Steve Carino, and then the first guy I saw when I went to ECW was Tony DeVito, and later he was my partner. And uh, that day, the first guy I saw was Tony DeVito was at Wilkesbury. So once again, we're back at Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania, after I'd become into ECW for two months for free. Um, getting to do like a run in to get beat up here or there, do a pull apart. Somebody bumps me, but basically I'm setting up the ring and working out and um, doing everything I can. If, if I could have set up that ring by myself, I would have just paying your dues. You got to show people. I always tell people, told people then tell them, tell them forever. If they're not letting you on the show yet, if you're not wrestling, you have to show them your work ethic somehow, you know, you have to show them how hard you're willing to work for what you want. And I did. Um, and uh, so the night before the Wilkesbury show, we're in a hotel room. I got the, the ring crew let me stay with them because they because uh, they were my friends. So I didn't have to pay for the room. And uh, I called home to my then wife and uh, she told me she was pregnant with my son. I said, oh, cow, holy cow. Um, I either got to get a job or I got to go home. That's all there is to it. We had two little girls at home, but we were just barely making it, you know. She had a job and I was on the road three or four days a week and doing carpentry the rest of the time. And, you know, but, you know, living for the dream, uh, trying, trying to have the life, you know? And so, uh, I was freaking out and the angel, God love him, uh, told somebody, uh, that story the next day. I'm quite sure it was Bill Alfonso and Bill Alfonso comes to up to me at Wilkesbury and says, do me a favor. I go, yes, sir. He says, go find Chris Chetty, Danny Doring, Tom Marquez, uh, Bill Wiles, Tony DeVito, Angel Medina. Uh, who else did he say? Um, Danny Doring, maybe I already said that. But basically, these are all guys that either were on or had been on ring crew and doing all the behind the scenes guys at that level. He says, go find them and tell them I want to see them. Yes, sir. And I did. And when I rounded them all up, they were all sitting in chairs and there was one empty, empty chair and Fonzie goes, sit down. And I am pooping my pants, right? And he says, uh, uh, this meeting is about you. And again, hoping for the best, but 
crap in my pants, you know. And he says, uh, I want you to know that over the course of the last two months, at one time or another, everybody in this circle, at least once, some of them more than once, has come to me and asked for me to go to bat for you. Um, you're here. You bust your ass. No one told you you had to. Um, you do it anyway. Um, we can see how bad you want this. We see how hard you work in the ring. And um, starting next week, you're on the payroll full time. Welcome to meet TCW if that's what you want. And I'm like, holy cow. And everybody like stood up like it was graduation day and, uh, you know, shook my hand or hugged me or whatnot. I'm like, holy cow. And I got to call home. And again, my ex-wife tells her and tell my parents. I'm like, man, it's starting to happen for us. So that, that was a real, real cool day. That was a good day. And then just to point out how friggin' old I am, my son uh, just turned 21. So I can't win that. That story feels like it was two weeks ago. But, um, wow. Yeah. That's so that crazy, though. That, like, that's how they t basically tell you you're in. They, they get the whole group together to tell you. Yeah. Right. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know if they did that with everybody, but, you know, that's, uh, or if they did it before or since, but, um, that's what they did with me. And that, that was a, that was a great day. And I, I, I was, you know, I don't, I, it's, it's hard to t tell that story without sounding like I'm bragging and I try not to, but I, I was proud of that day. Very cool kind of way to break into ECW. What did you think about he said when you first got there? Because you always hear the, the stories like, oh, the, the the locker room is crazy. They all get along, but they're all nuts. And, you know, like you always hear these crazy stories, drugs and everything else. Yeah, that's all true. <laughs> you know, pretty much, <laughs> you know. Yeah, a lot of crazies, but all uh, and a lot of partiers and a lot of wild stuff. But very, very, very much a family. I mean. And, and, and clearly, you know, it still is, you know, we saw a bunch of Tony and I did a autograph signing on the legends fest here a month or two ago. And there's a bunch of ECW guys and get everybody gets together and take gets pictures taken together. And you always have friends in the business, you know, everybody, but it's not like there's, you know, I don't know. There, I don't think you'd ever see like a, Oh, here's a bunch of people voluntarily. Here's nineties WWE guys getting together for a reunion that they're just they might get together but they're just the boys you know this is ecw this is this and everybody that was there still it's so much part of them you know they consider themselves ecw that it's in their blood you know and, and it was a big honor to be a part of that team so you know a junior member for most of my time but you know earned my stripes as we went but um it uh but it was it was it was great, man. It was uh it was some it was some of my best times ever. But you know, scary, super scary. You know, in that you don't want to mess up and you don't want to. They were so adamant about, in a good way, paying your dues and doing things the right way. And you know, you hear the stories about the craziness and the partying and the drugs, and that's all true. But it's all somehow still in a respect the veterans, do everything right, business done the right way kind of way it was beautiful it's kind of hard to describe but um certainly scary in that you know you're uh because the fan base is so rabid like nothing before or since you know and um and uh not so much scary of the style you know you think it would be but it was you know once you got to know these guys you know nobody's really trying to kill you you know although that's not a place where you wanted to be disrespectful either i mean you didn't want to you didn't want to be disrespectful to a veteran or to the business or anything like that because you'd get stretched. You know, if it, if you were lucky, you got stretched. If you weren't lucky, you'd just get fired, right? But um, but uh, uh it, but I, I do say scary in that you know, I'm a young guy and it's like you you spend all day working your ass off, setting up the ring as fast as you can, getting dressed as fast as you can so that you can get in the ring with Tracy Smothers, and then do whatever duties are else. Uh, are, are otherwise asked of you and just praying that you get a match that night because not everybody worked every night, you know, and um, praying that you get a match that night. And then when Dream or whoever's walking around the lineup, half hoping you don't, which is because it's so nerve wracking, you know, and, uh, but, um, but yeah, it, it was, a, it was a great, great time. Um, but yeah, I mean, you talk about paying your dues. I mean, that's, that was old school, man. It, it really, really was. And it was the, I'm not going to, I'm not one of these old farts that's going to say these kids today don't, know what it's like to pay their dues some of them clearly don't and it's probably been that way forever but and i know some of them do but speaking for me personally 
There was many a day in, in ECW where I drove the ring truck, set up the ring, worked out with Tracy, sold T-shirts while the people were coming in, uh, uh, ref wrestled referee and ring announced from backstage on the same show, tore down the ring, and drove to the next town in the same day. And that's paying your dues, you know? And I mean, there was driving from Columbus, Georgia to, I can't remember, wherever the next town was, only a couple hours away, but oh, the ring truck was full. So I had a ride in the back of a 20 foot moving van, which, you know, it's, it's a rider truck that's just painted to say ECW on. There are no windows in that thing. I'm on top of the ring, on top of the pile of stuff, just, the low man, you know, you're the newest guy on ring crew. They, uh, you know, you get the grunt work. And so, um, but you do those things and you get through them together, you know, kind of, you know, and uh, with with the other folks around there with you, and, and it gives you something to be proud of, you know. And at the end of the day, I, I do. You're never ever done paying your dues, but you know, uh, uh, if you if you want to be successful, there's always work to do, work to be done, but. But I earn my stripes, man, you know, and um, when I get for whatever anybody wants to say about me or the complimentary things or if anybody has to say anything, the opposite of that, I do know that I earn my stripes. And, and, uh, and I'm, you know, proud to call myself a veteran of our business. And I feel like I earned it. So and it really started there. When do you become the extreme referee? Uh, Salem, New Hampshire. I remember, well, no, I take that back. I know I, I was um, I'd been doing the house show thing quite a bit where I where I, you know, go out and I didn't have I didn't know who HC Loke was. You know, I didn't know who that was until after ECW, to be honest with you. It took me till Ring of Honor to really figure it out. But um, I'd been, you know, wrestling and cut off jeans and whatever T-shirt I had or whatever I could find trying to figure it out on some house shows. Um, uh, and I had a couple good ones. And I remember we were in Florida somewhere. And um, walking through the hallway, and I was walking with somebody, I don't remember who, and Dreamer said to whoever I was walking with, hey, you're going to work so-and-so on tonight's show. And I was used to not working TVs because I wasn't, didn't have a spot there. I didn't have a, a, a character yet or an angle there or really anything, you know. I was, I, I would, so if I did anything on TV, it was just a run-in or a pull-apart or something like that. Um, and Dreamer turned to walk away, and he turned back around, Point to me, he goes, you, and he stopped and thought for a minute, and he goes, you want a ref? And uh, it, and I go, if that's what you want me to do, sir, sure. And he, he says, I know you're not looking to be a ref full time, but, you know, you've been doing really, really good, and I want to get you on the show so you get paid. Because there's no guarantees there. You know, you got the nights you worked, you got paid. The nights you didn't, you didn't, you know, unless you were under contract, you know. But guys at, at, at my level, our level, we, we weren't there yet. So, right. so I refed and that was cool. And then it would just kind of be, um, uh, I don't know how much longer it was after that, but if I, it would go to a show, if I, uh, if I had a match, I'd have a match. If I didn't have a match, they'd let me ref just so I could get paid. Basically it was a favor. Um, until we went to Milwaukee, Wisconsin and Steve Carino was starting his feud with Dusty Rhodes. And, um, they wanted, uh, Steve to go out and run down the town, keep running it down, keep running it down, keep running it down. The idea was that I was the referee in the ring waiting for to um, to referee his match or, or whatever uh, when he was done with his promo. And I would get sick of him running down the town and I would come steal the mic away from him and basically say that I'm from Milwaukee and blah, 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 blah. And you wouldn't last an hour on the streets of our city. That was the go home line. And I ended up cutting a pretty good promo and um, <clears throat> the people were right there with it. And uh, Steve was going to swing the cowbell, the rope and cowbell and hit me over the head with it. Uh, Paul's idea was for him to swing it like a baseball bat, by the way, and hit me in the side of the head. But uh, thank God Steve was looking out for me a little bit and swung it overhand, hit me. I was all ready to get some color and all those things. And boy, I didn't have to. And uh, I went down like – I was all ready to, to gig myself. I could see with my heartbeat the pss, pss, pss coming out on the mat from that cowbell. Yep. And uh, if you if you were to find that clip and watch that, you could see for a minute I slip out of character and remember that I'm the asshole that's got to clean this ring later. So instantly 
just for a second, I start wiping it like I'm cleaning it up. And if I went and just, it was just like a millisecond, like I went yeah. on autopilot to do yeah. that. And um, so we're sitting there and I'm just bleeding to death. And it was, it was a really good segment. Um, I had to take the ambulance to the hospital that night. It was so silly to get however many 25 staples, I think, in my forehead, which Joey Styles called 57 and then 97. Every week got to be more and more. That was a big rib on television. Um, had to take an ambulance to the hospital, get stapled up. Had to take a, a cab back to the arena afterwards, still in the referee shirt, covered with blood. And my good friend, Tony DeVito and Angel Medina, had left the ring for me to be tore down because they're my good buddies. Again, pay your dues, kid. So, uh, and um, I went by and Paul happened to be sitting there. And I said, Paul, thank you for letting me do that tonight, sir. And he goes, look, that was fucking tremendous, fucking tremendous. And, um, you know, because I'd cut a pretty good promo. And I hadn't had a lot of promo experience, to be honest with you. But sometimes, you know, the light shines on you just right and you have a moment and you feel it. And um, and uh, I don't, I never had a mic in my hand in ECW up until that point, I don't believe. Um, but I did, and I was happy to be in TV taping, and I did well, and I got lucky. Um so then we were kind of off to the races with that. And uh, we um, ended up, I think, maybe whenever those staples were out, uh, we did something in Salem, New Hampshire, where um, where uh, Steve came out and got in my face or whatever a little bit. And I bickered back and forth and grabbed the mic again. And um, I challenged him to a fight. And he said, no, you're going to fight my man Chili Willie, if you remember Chili. And it might have been his first TV match, too. And we came in. He came in, we had a quick little match, and the finish being uh, Steve tried to throw him the cowbell that he busted me open with. I booted him in the stomach, stole the bell from him, hit him in the head, covered him, and counted three myself and rang the bell. And people popped for that because it was a cute little thing. So we did that with a different heel on a lot of the house shows. We'd go around, and a heel would come out, get in my face, challenge me somehow, either start beating on me or I'd beat on him until I hit a finish, count three myself and ring the bell and and uh, it was just a cute little thing but that's how the extreme official became it became a thing and until they added danny daniels who was a heel referee yep. and we kind yep. of feuded with each other there a little bit but but yeah i got the question for forever uh what was it like uh being a referee and then learning to wrestle and, and no i was a wrestler who had to <laughs> be a referee for my character but uh i guess it doesn't really matter but i i used to have to answer that question all the time but yeah it was fun did you, did you ever think like okay i gotta pretend i can't wrestle because i'm a referee you ever have that like conundrum no i, I guess i didn't and in all honesty i never really thought about that but that would made good sense that have made sense uh psychology wise but in all honestly and maybe this was selfishness on my part i was eager to show that i could wrestle so i could be a full-time wrestler right. um in hindsight why would it matter? I was on the show and I was physically wrestling every day and I had a unique character that wasn't like anybody else on the show and not saying that it came directly from me. And even if it did, it wasn't my idea anyway. But while I was doing that, they did something on raw where Earl Hebner had to wrestle or something like that. And they'd never done that before. So clearly it was because there was a guy wrestling on the ECW show, not because it was me, but there was a, a referee wrestling, you know? Um, so it was a great spot. But they saw the idea, yeah, right, yeah. And I, I don't want to say I was eager to get away from, away from it because I wasn't, I was so thankful for it. But you know, you pitch yourself, I just I want to be a wrestler, man. You know, I want to I want to wrestle full time, and um, uh, and uh, but in hindsight, that that had been a great character to have forever, you know, that, that was cool. With Danny Daniels coming in, did you feel like uh, it's kind of killing my thunder a little bit? Or were you like, okay, this is good. We can do a little face heel dynamic. I was 100% excited about that. Super excited because it gave me a feud instantly. And um, I, I mean, I did the thing with Steve Carino. We had some matches a little bit, with which involved Dusty Rhodes. I mean, how great is that? You That's know, awesome. so I, I was yeah. so lucky. But um, when Danny Daniels came in, it was, now this is awesome because the, you know, it's, it's, he and I kind of, playing off each other always, you know, there was, it, um, so, uh, and then we'd had a couple singles, Matt Hammerstein ballroom. We had a match against two refs, uh, wrestling each other. And, um, actually speaking of the dumb little referee spots we would do, uh, I did this spot where he's the heel 
So he's choking me in the corner. And um, I counted five myself to try to get him to break it. It was <laughs> dumb. But, uh, yeah. you know, trying to come up with cute little things. Um, I loved Danny being there, though. It was awesome. He was a good friend. And uh, he was a good worker. And, uh, and, and we, you know, it, it really gave us both something to do all the time, you know. So it was very – and actually, had ECW continued – the plan was for me to switch heel, have us both wear um, like wrestling singlets that were black and white striped like referees. And we were going to be a tag team called The Law. That was the uh, that was Dreamer's idea. But, you know, we didn't make it that far. That was yeah. that was the plan. Yeah. So was Paul kind of in charge or was it more Dreamer? Because a lot of the guys are saying towards that era it was more like Dreamer. And, and a little bit of Lance Storm when he was there and a little bit of Raven mixed in when he was there. We're like doing a lot of booking. Was it more Dreamer? Or it was, yeah, it was more, it was very much Dreamer. I mean, Paul was the ultimate decision maker. Um, uh, but unless you were Rob Van Dam or Rhino or, you know, probably Steve Carino or, you know, a few of those top four or five guys at that time, um, you know, you basically, uh, Dreamer would tell you what you're going to do and you discuss yourself with him. Not that Paul was off limits by any means. I'm not saying that, but, um, and certainly, um, by the end, um, Paul wasn't coming to house shows and I don't even think he was making all the TVs. I mean, I know he didn't because I can remember right before we went in the ring one time, um, him calling with an idea for a spot he wanted to add to our match and, Rhino or whoever was frustrated because, oh, we're all ready to go and he's not even here. So we're trying to explain over the phone what he wants to see in our match. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it was mainly Dreamer. I mean, as far as Lance Storm, Lance, Lance is a hell of a mind, hell of a talent. I don't recall him having anything to do with anything. That, at least nothing that had anything to do with me, and I never saw him have anything to do with people booking. And um, Raven kind of always did. I don't know if, like, in an official capacity, but he was considered a genius and a certainly a mentor and one of the founding fathers there. So, you know, if he had something to say, you'd listen and he, and he would offer that up from time to time. What about Paul as far as being a genius? I love asking the ex ECW guys, was Paul a genius? I a hundred percent believe so. I mean, I've seen him. Uh, I mean, especially when you think of like the way he would edit those shows, you know, and just make them so, uh, uh, so entertaining and so kind of must see. But if you watch them out of context, they might not be. You know what I mean? It's certainly not great production value. Certainly without the music there, and you know. But he had this way of taking guys that might not be considered, you know, the greatest talent in the world, and 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 putting them in the right spots to make them superstars. You know, and um, at least on and I say at least on that level, but that was a pretty huge level. You know, I mean, in all reality, uh, you know, just based on his work alone, the Sandman wouldn't have been anywhere near that or even been given the opportunity to in any other company. You know, um, uh, but I, I certainly see Paul as a genius as far as that. And of course, right now, the work he's doing is off the charge, off the charts. But um, but again, for me personally, there's a few times when he was super complimentary to me and very good to me and gave me things to do. But most of the time I was, I was, uh, I say I was, I was working for dreamer and and seeking his approval. Most of the time, you know, that was a big thing. And it's, uh, sometimes like when my guys will have a good match now and I take them aside and tell them so and tell them I'm proud of them. And I see the look in their eye or see them sometimes get emotional, you know, even because this stuff is, very real on a level, you know, um, um, I know right what they're feeling because I can remember those times of getting out of the ring and it going well and, um, dreamer telling me he was proud of me. And it was just like, man, that's, you don't even got to pay me. Thank you. <laughs> you know, So, uh, it was, yeah. So, so yes, I, my, you know, there's no such thing as a short answer with me. I, I run my mouth a lot when we get talking about wrestling, but yeah, Dreamer, I think, or, or Paul, I would definitely consider a genius. I considered myself more kind of working more for Dreamer, though, so I didn't get to see it that much as far as working with me, but I got to see it with other people. What did you think about the end of ECW? Were you shocked, and were you at the final shows? Yeah, I was. Um, uh, I didn't really, it just didn't really seem like it was going to go away. 
But I also can't remember seeing how it could continue either, if that makes any sense. But mm-hmm. it was just like, we'll be all right. We'll be all right. And then it's gone, you know, and um, it was uh, it was such a weird time. And I almost was bitter about it for a little while because um, I didn't really think it was going to go. And then once it did, I was um, almost, and it sounds so terrible, because, but, you know, I've gone a lot, you know. Uh, we didn't make a lot of money. And, of course, you know, by the end, the checks weren't always coming and all those things, you know. And um, for a while there, because Ring Crew drove, mind you, I didn't want to fly in anywhere. Um, I'm on the road sometimes four or five days a week. One, at one point, you know, I was gone for three weeks because we were so far away that it didn't make any sense to come home in between. Um, you know, we would do stuff like that sometimes. And, you know, I've got a young family at home. And for, I'm not saying for a long time, but for like a few days, it was almost like it's kind of nice to breathe for a second. And then you think, well, oh my gosh, what am I going to do next? You know, or, or what do I, what do I do without this? You know, and I don't know how long it was, but fast forward till, well, yeah, I do. It was, uh, I guess it was when they started doing those, uh, one night stands and stuff like that. You kind of, are we going back to work or what's good? But clearly, you know, that that's what we all thought, but it obviously it, it wasn't like that. It wasn't really ECW coming back, at least not in that, you know, Paul and Tommy could just do whatever they wanted to again. So, yep. so that didn't happen for a lot of us, but, but yeah, it, it was, it was, it was, it was pretty shocking. Um, but looking back, I don't know why I would have been shocked because there, I mean, there wasn't any money and the houses were going down and all of a sudden there wasn't lights at TV. We're shooting TV with the house lights on. And like, I remember on a couple of occasions, you know, like, uh, like, Looks just looking like an Indiana high school gym or something like that. When we'd gone from when I was there from the first TNN taping to the end of that, when when that thing started, we had semi truck out there and you know lighting grids and all those things. And I'm like, man, I'm here at the right time. And man, two years later, whatever it was, I I don't know the timeline. It was the complete opposite, but it it was it was shocking. It was hard. When it all goes away and, and it's gone, obviously you end up in Ring of Honor about a year or so later. Yeah. How'd you get in with ROH? Is that a, a Gabe thing? Did Gabe yeah. end up bringing you in? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, w- I had uh, I had actually um, formed a tag team, not the Carnage Crew, on the Indies. And I heard that those guys were doing that stuff. Um, and uh, and I messaged them and, uh, and sent them a tape of what we were doing. And... Uh, and I had kind of like a highlight reel tape and he really liked that. So, um, or seemed to like it enough, you know, and his plan was for me to come in. I was, I actually have the kind of cool honor of being like the first in ring talent to walk through a ring of honor curtain. Cause I refereed the first match ever. Cause we were going to, that's what we, we got rid of the extreme official thing forever there. Um, I did a couple thing ref spots on that first show and then homicide, gave me the fork and got, got, gave me color and gave me his cop killer finisher. That was it. I was going to come back with my partner and challenge him. And that was going to be my first feud. And that was the plan until show number two, when uh, my partner at that time, who was pretty green, but uh, he was a Tony DeVito student actually. Um, uh, but a good guy, big guy, totally nervous and completely shit the bat out there. And uh, to the point where they didn't want him back. And that's not me shitting on the guy. I don't know where he is now. Love him to death, you know, if I were to see him. But um, that's just what happened. So um, <clears throat> Gabe called and said, uh, hey, do you have another partner in mind that um, that uh, you can you can bring in? Is there something else? Actually, I think he said pick Dunner Marcos because I brought Dunner Marcos to the first one with me to help with Rinku. And I said, that's great, you know. Um, but I mean, I didn't see that too much. I love those guys; they're my students. But um, I said, "Well, they're tag team already." Um, I said, "What do you think about Tony DeVito, who was a, one of the baldies in Carnage Crew?" I love Tony DeVito; he's one of my favorite brawlers ever. You know, and um, I said, "Let me give him a call," and I did. And Tony liked that idea, and that was 
that then we were off to the races. So if you if you ever sourced out like the videotape of the second show of Ring of Honor, that's the only show I wasn't on, but I was on it. They just scrapped it from the tape. They just erased that whole thing of that previous partner from history. So that that never that footage never saw the light of day. Um, so you know it was we were kind of right on the everybody was right on the same page there. Like uh, Gabe wanted us to come to the ring with some type of weapon. Think about what kind of weapon you want to bring. Um, you wanted that to be our character. <coughs> and for whatever reason, I had it in my head. Um, uh, PG-13 used to carry hubcaps on chains to, in Memphis yes. to the ring. And I was thinking about that. And the next time we talked, before I could say that, he says, do you remember when PG-13 used to take the hubcaps to the ring? I go, yes, that's exactly what I was thinking. And then we said, well, we got to think of a tag team name. I said, all right. So the, the next time we talked, I can't remember. Either, either he was thinking Carnage Crew and I was thinking Cannibal Crew or vice versa. But one of us said Cannibal Crew and one of us said Carnage Crew. And they're so friggin' similar anyway. It's still CC and both have crew in it. Yep. I'm like, this is meant to be. <laughs> so we ended up with Carnage Crew. And um, the rest is kind of history. We were uh, – we ended up uh, – you know, I think we were meant to be an underneath team, and it's not like uh, uh, at first, but we were doing really good work and um, went on, you know, from there to have some real good feuds, some real good matches, had a little run with the belts. Mine's right over there still. But, uh, uh, and, um, and uh, that was, that was, that was, that was when things really started clicking for me. I said earlier that I didn't know who HC Loke was, so I was eight years in the business. And that was then. I can remember when Tony came in and, and then we were feuding with Homicide, and we ended up having that match with Homicide and Abdullah the Butcher. And it was, and I was cutting promos for that. And I get this now. I get who I am. I'm just a dude who doesn't got to dress too fancy and likes to fight, but I don't care if you beat me up. That was, a, I don't care if, if you kick our ass. We just want to fight you. And then I got it. You know, then I'm like, I knew how to talk. I knew what I was talking about. I knew how to act. And, and um, I have my students now that, you know, one student I love him so much. His name's uh, TJ Epics. He's uh, he's probably my top guy right now. He just had his 88th match, and he's just turned just got two years in, so that's really good. And he's he's doing excellent. He's got some big things coming up. But he's like, oh, I don't. I'm still trying to figure out what my character is, and he stresses out about it. I'm like, buddy, you're wrestling. You're you're wrestling, and you're doing good, and people like you. That's enough. Okay. It took me eight years to know who I was. So so he'll get there, but. But that's when we hit our stride, right around then. Carnage Crew with Tony DeVito. That's when everything started clicking, and I knew, damn it, I'm good at this. I, uh, I know my, I, I know what I'm doing now. So th those were those were the good times. And the feud with Special K, of course. You know, you guys yeah, that, had a feud that, everywhere, basically. Yeah, that 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 was a big deal for us. Um, I still that still comes up now. I still wrestle once in a while, and like in the last year, I wrestled Special K members, and that comes up in the. Uh, promos or non commentary or whatever or whatever we're doing but that was a big deal and and that was cool because ring of honor was set up to be a real territory and a real uh something that was supposed to make money over a long time not just these one off shows you know so the special k guys who um they were those were our guys to teach that's why there was a million of them and they were always fighting us so that we could teach them you know, and then Jay Lethal started there, and he's been their champion however many times, and he's still there, you know, and, yep. and we got to work with a bunch of good dudes coming up through there. So that was a good view. That was probably the probably the team we wrestled the most was different incarnations of the of Special K while we were there. And Dusty yeah. even helps out the Carnage crew in that big scramble cage match in New Jersey at our best. Yes, that was awesome. That was uh, – I had the idea of, uh, hey, uh, do you think it would be okay if – after the match, Dusty brings a case of beer out there, and we celebrate with the fans, and they like that idea. So, so he did that, and we cut a few promos together. And, but man, how good is this? Is this as good as it gets? You know, I uh, just main evented this thing and this the scramble cage match, which I helped invent. You know, it was, that was mine and Gabe's idea. They had the platforms up on the corners for the guys. Yeah. So I built those. You know, so it's I. You know, I I got to I was got to agent these matches and now here I have Dusty Rhodes coming out as part of it. Like if that could have, you know, if that could have gone on forever, that would have been great too. You know, it was a, 
I, I just feel very lucky, very blessed about that. I have stories like that to tell you today. You know, it was cool. You know, I was very lucky. Worked hard for it, but it's still a lot of luck. Awesome show. I was there. I mean, Dusty's there. Steamboat's on that show. I mean, that that was great. Yeah, yeah, that, that was fun. Loved having Crazy Steamboat on posted. What's that? Crazy cage Crazy match too. Crazy cage match. Yeah, we had a couple of them in that building. That was the. Uh, that wasn't that night, but that was the, you know, the infamous Teddy Hart story where he, um, yeah, kind of uh, everybody wanted to beat him up and threw him out of the locker room and blah, blah, blah. That was after a scramble cage match there. And, but yeah, we always had some fun ones. I think Jack Evans, right. Didn't he take a crazy bump that night too? Yeah, he did a, um, I just saw Jack at dynamite this last Wednesday. Uh, he got his head shaved. Um, <laughs> but uh, he, uh, he's doing well. Cause I didn't see him in a long time. He, Gives me the big bear hug. But, um, yeah, he did a double moonsault, double backflip off the top of the cage to the outside that night. Just nuts. I don't even know where you get the idea to maybe dare try that. Yeah. Those guys could do it. It's funny. I don't like flips and, you know, all that kind of stuff in my wrestling, but I give him a pass just because he's nuts. You know what I mean? Yeah, I I agree. I I think about it the same way. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So what was your feeling when you eventually faced Whitmer and Jacobs? You win the tag team titles. You and DeVito are finally the uh, tag team champions of Ring of Honor. Pretty awesome. It was awesome. It was uh, – I um, I was emotional afterwards, you know, because in our minds, you know, um, you know how it is. And pro wrestling might be a work, but there's some titles that just feel like these are legitimate world titles. You know, it means something, you know, and uh, and that really did. And uh, because it was getting so much attention, you know, it uh, you know, it was it was you know, guys were getting signed out of Ring of Honor and all those things. And not that that was ever my goal. As a matter of fact, uh, it was my goal not to. I wanted to be a lifer for Ring of Honor. As a matter of fact, that's that's a shoot. I can remember. Not that he, not that I don't want it to be read like I had an offer, but having a conversation with Tom Pritchard one day, he says, "Would you want to come to WWE?" I think it might have still been WWF, whatever. I said, no, <laughs> young and fairly young. I guess I was 30 something, you know, and, and like, no, I love what I'm doing. Uh, but, um, not that he was give offering me a job, but it was just a conversation, you know? Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, that, that really felt great. You know, it was, uh, it was kind of a culmination of a lot of hard work, a lot of years. Um, and, uh, I was did it with my best friend, you know, so. It was, it was really cool. Um, that was in New York City, so super hot crowd, and and um, we we had a great time with them. And uh, and you know, we still stuff like that. That's stuff like that. That's as corny as it sounds. And I and I reference this a lot as it pertains to wrestling. But stuff like that, you get to live forever with that, you know. Because as long as as long as there's pro wrestling fans, no one's ever going to forget that Ring of Honor was a thing. You know what I mean? And, and it's. It's a major part of the industry. It cha- it helped change the industry as in some ways as much as ECW did. You know, when it started to be um, faster paced, hard hitting, athleticism, some more pure wrestling started to show up on WWE. Like we always said at the time, like WrestleMania 20, when you see um, uh, Eddie Guerrero and Benoit winning both those titles from, I mean, that's all, that's, that's from a pace that, Ring of Honor started where it's, oh, it's about being good at this in the ring. You know what I mean? And stuff like that was, that was, uh, Ring of Honor contributed a lot to the industry. And if, uh, whether you know who H.C. Loke is or not, whether you know who Tony DeVito is or not, if you, um, are a student of pro wrestling and care about it and look back, that's always going to be there, you know, as, as a cool thing we got to be a part of and something, something we got to do. So I'll always be proud of that. And it's funny, like, I don't ask him to. But every weekend, um, it, usually, you know, sometimes they don't, but a ring announcer will ask me my weight in hometown and uh, blah, 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 and they'll be inter- introducing me, and they always add on their own. And he's an ECW original and a former Ring of Honor tag team champion. And I get to, you know, that's cool, man. That's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's show business. The business is, you know, it's about – uh, uh self promotion and getting over any way you can anyway and i get to have those little accolades i get to have those little uh things to go on my on my resume and i'm awful proud of it yeah pretty damn good on the resume for sure yeah. ECW original and 
ROH Tag Team Champion. Now, you mentioned you were a ROH agent as well. When was that? That was most of my time. Uh, I would say I'm, I'm terrible with dates. I don't know how long I was there before it happened, but um, but I was the first guy they hired to do that and the only guy they hired to do that at while I was there. And um, I, you know, in all honesty, that's a regret I have. I could have made more of that. I really, really could have. Um, but I would help guys with their matches and, and kind of go over finishes with some of the guys, kind of relay stuff to, uh, to, uh, to the talent. Um, but I could have done so much more with it. You know, I was, I was very much about my career. I, and I don't want to make that sound like I was selfish, but, but it was, um, that's cool. That's a huge compliment. You asked me to do that and I'll help, but I'm focusing on, you know, well, let me figure out what I'm doing in my match and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, I didn't, I don't know that I used all my time as wisely as I could have then. I do that a lot now, certainly not on that scale, like on a ring of honor scale, but there's two or three indies that when they book me, they'll um, ask me to age in other matches too. In fact, there's two places that book me in just to age, which is cool, you know, just help other guys with their matches. You know, it's a, it's an easy way to make a payday without taking any bumps, but, yeah. but, um, but, um, basically, uh, I could have made more of that. I, I honestly did. And, you know, if you know, to be honest, and if I'm going to be a, a good interview and a good coach for pro wrestling and a good and a good trainer and a good veteran, you know, honesty is part of that. At those times, um, and though my marriage at the time wasn't doing that great, I was probably drinking a little bit more than I should, and we were, you know, having good matches and having a great time. But we were also, I say we. I'm going to not throw anybody else under the bus, but. Looking forward to having a few beers and having fun at the shows. And that was kind of my escape from my home life a little bit. And I, if I, um, if I'd, uh, I can't help but wonder if I'd, uh, done more with the, uh, with, with my responsibilities as far as helping the rest of the talent, not just my own matches. I did, you know, and I was always the guy that they would pull aside. People might pull aside for advice or, just stuff like that, and which is funny. A bit one of the huge compliment I got with either Gabe or somebody would say, "All right, Dreamer," because I'd be the guy that you know. Because that's what like, that's a huge compliment because Dreamer was my man, you know. So, um, but uh, as far as like the actual age thing stuff, I did it, but I would probably, if I'm honest, I probably did the bare minimum of it because I was still kind of in my own world, you know, a little bit, you know, wanting to be a star myself and also struggling a little bit and drinking a little bit too much in those days. So, but, um, that's not a thing anymore. So thank God. So, um, but, uh, but it was cool. I mean, that's, again, that's a little, if I'm writing a wrestling resume, I get to say, Oh yeah, I was also the first guy in the ring of honor hired to be an agent. So that's kind of cool. So I do wish I did more with it though, if I'm being honest. Now, as we hit the wind down, we head towards the finish here. What's next for HC look? What, what do you got up on tap? I, well, um, I've got a lot of bookings. I'm going to keep doing this school. I'll, I'll try to do that forever if I can. Um, um, coming up in a month, uh, before we started recording, I think I told you that I, I in the in the last few months, I teamed with DeVito uh, at WrestleMania week, where we um, actually we had a six man, and New Jack was our was our third partner, and that ended up being his last match. So that's sad, but also we're glad that we were around. You know. Um, and maybe a month ago, I teamed with Justin Credible at an indie show. And uh, a month from now, November 6th in Binghamton for a company called Excite Wrestling, myself and Masada, another member of the Carnage crew, are in a steel cage, hardcore, some are calling it death match. We'll see against uh, Cade, who used to be known as Stockade, who's known a lot in those world, and G Raver, who's a big hardcore deathmatch guy so um and i don't do that that's not something that i pull out of my bag of tricks every weekend so um it's gonna be pretty special i haven't seen with masada in a long time i don't know the last time he was even in new york to work so you probably start hearing my dogs playing now but um so uh i'm excited about that that's what's going on all right um uh i'm really excited about that and then as far as future future I'll be honest with you, man. I turned 47 years old this Friday, and I'm nowhere near done. 
if the industry's not done with me, I'm not done with the industry. Um, Indies are going real, real, real strong for me. But I'll be honest with you, man. I want another, another little run somewhere on television, somewhere with that. Be it a couple more matches in Ring of Honor, something MLW, NWA. And I got to tell you, after visiting the folks at Dynamite this last weekend and seeing some friends there, I would love to do a little something in the AEW. And um, I don't know if that's on the horizon. I got a couple friends there. I gotta, I gotta go through the right channels. I, I would love to see that happen. And if, if I could write my own story, book it myself, you know, I'd love to work a match or two, or as many as they have me, or two million if they want. But I'd like to get a couple matches under my belt, add a couple more things to that resume. And if then for one of those bigger companies, if I could start doing a little bit of that agent role or helping, so just being a veteran to some talking to guys about their matches, helping out in any way I could that way to the, to the younger talent. And then um, uh, kind of parlay that into a little bit more of a full-time gig. That, that would be the dream for me. If it doesn't happen, I love being an independent wrestler. I love being a teacher. So we'll keep doing that. But that's the ultimate goal. The one more, every old guy says that. But five years ago, you'd say I was too old. These days, who knows, man? It's, uh, it's kind of a different world out there now. And there's a lot of guys getting opportunities. At an older age, there's a lot of guys staying in there longer. And it's not like I'm starting from complete scratch where I've never been seen nationally before. I No one's going to confuse me with the biggest superstars in the world. But but you kind of know who I am a little bit, you know what I mean? So, And there's stories we can tell there. So if I can parlay that into maybe another little TV gig, doing a little something, that's the dream. I'm, I'm going to try. I'm going to try as hard as I can. And, and um, believe me, when I went to ECW, when I went to Ring of Honor, it wasn't because I was the highest sought after talent in the world and they came after me. I worked hard and I came after them and 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 I did really well at both. And I think I can do it again. We're gonna, I'm going to try. So we'll see. Would love to see it. But before we let you go, where can everybody find you? Social media, plugs, all that good stuff. Yeah. Um, certainly if you uh, – if, if Facebook is, uh, is what I'm most active on and if you search HC Look, it will come up. It's in the parentheses after my shoot name, Matt Knowles. And I tried to switch it, but I can't figure out how. Again, I'm going to be 47 this weekend, so I don't really know how to do that stuff. But I'm trying. Uh, but if you search HC Loke on Facebook, that'll come up. But Instagram is at HC Loke 1. And Twitter, anybody listening to this, John, if you want to share this, this would be great. If you want to jump on Twitter and go to at HC Loke 1 and just throw me a follow, because I'm new to that. I know that's a huge part of our game these days is, is your Twitter action. And um, and I'm trying to like really get those numbers up. I share something on Facebook. I share a picture of me wrestling on Facebook. I get 200 likes. I share it on Twitter. I get three. <laughs> you know, so I don't yeah. know what I'm doing over there. Yeah, but I'm trying to figure that world out. So if, if you all will check me out on those places and help me out, I really appreciate it. And and I got some cool stuff coming up. And if, I, and if uh, things go my way, I'll have even some more cool things to announce pretty soon. So. And those are the places to check me out. All right. Great stuff. H.C. Loke, thank you so much for all the time today. Really appreciate it. Man, thanks for having me. It was a fun talk.